bless you. Good morning, everyone. You doing all right this morning? All right, the trains are running a little late. It's my fault, so, but do you love me anyway? All right, good. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. I'm going to teach you a Greek word today. It's the word pragmatuomai. Luke chapter 19. While you find your way there, a couple of quick announcements. First of all, I want to let you know for all of our college students, uh, our friends Rodrigo and Priscilla Vascanellis are going to be uh, taking leadership of our abstract college ministry. Uh, we're thrilled that um, they are taking the foundation that Pastor Bobby has built over the last year, and they're going to be uh, leading our uh, group of college students and young adults. And so if you're in college, if you are uh, a young adult of that age, we want to invite you to come on Tuesday evening and check out the abstract uh, and it's going to be a great time together. And then just very quickly, uh, groundbreaking is next Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Uh, do not come at 1130. If you come at 1130, you will miss everything and we won't feed you. We won't give you anything to eat. Uh, come at 10 o'clock. Uh, we would like to ask you to help us uh, by we want to try and bring as few cars as possible. So uh, we sometimes families, because of uh, their schedule serving here, families come in more than one car. We have some families who have five members and manage to bring six cars. Uh, so families, if you can travel together in one car, and uh, if you can, if it's possible that there's someone nearby that you can ride with, um, we want to just try and uh, get as many cars as we can in on the parking lot. We're going to have a big tent out on the lawn. Uh, pastor Tate, our founding pastor, is going to be with us, and uh, several of our friends who have been just part of this journey over the last 17 years. So don't miss a great day next Sunday at 10 o'clock. All right, look with me in Luke chapter 19. Let's talk about the parable of the 10 minas, and let's talk about this Greek word called pragmatuomai. Luke 19, beginning in verse 11. It says, while they were listening to this, Jesus went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. Jesus said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called 10 of his servants and he gave them 10 minas. A mina is a bar of silver or a bar of gold. It's like an ingot. Uh, your Bible might say talent, but it is a, a piece of gold. He, he said, put this money to work until I come back. But his subjects hated him, and they sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and he returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, sir, your mina has earned ten more. This, well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and you reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I'm a hard man, taking out what I do not put in and reaping what I do not sow. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have at least collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. Sir, they said, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that everyone who has, more will be given, but as for the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to minister to us. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your people that you love so much and for your presence here. Father, I pray that we would encounter you through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees, just say amen, amen. and amen. A Bible study group was discussing the imminence of Jesus' return. And the group leader asked the group, what would you do if you knew that the end of the world was coming in four weeks? One sister very piously said, 
I would pour myself into serving my Lord, into serving my family and my church family and my community without reserve. Everyone nodded in agreement. Not to be outdone, another sister said with gusto, I would go out into the highways and byways and I would tell everyone who hadn't heard yet the good news of the gospel. Everyone smiled and agreed enthusiastically. Then a man who had been sitting quietly by the whole time spoke up and he said, I would pack my bags and go at once to my mother-in-law's house. The whole group turned and looked at him confused. The group leader gulped and he said, why on earth would you do that? The man replied, that would make for the longest four weeks of my life. <laughs> Hope my mother-in-law is not watching on live streaming today. I love you, Mom Watch it. <laughs> what should you do when it looks as if the end might just be around the corner? What should be your game plan? What should be your strategy? Should you go like gangbusters? Should you go for broke? Should you launch a $12 million project? Should you fast and pray and sacrifice and labor to build a 40,000 square foot addition? See, I, I need to know the answer to that. Should you keep pushing forward? Should you keep trying to lay a foundation for the next generation? Should you keep trying to extend the reach of the church's ministry to reach more and more people? Or if it looks like the end is near, should you just circle the wagons and wait for Jesus to arrive? Tell me, Kenny, how do you know when to hold up, when to fold up, when to walk away, and when to run? What should we do when it looks like the end might be near? Jesus wanted us to know. So he gave us this parable. Luke 17, 11 says that Jesus told this parable because he was drawing near to Jerusalem. He was about 17 miles away now in the city of Jericho. He was on his way up to Jerusalem for the Passover. He, he was on his way to give his life on the cross as God's sacrificial lamb. But some of Jesus' followers misunderstood they thought that he was on his way to seize the throne of Israel, to usher in the messianic kingdom. They thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at any moment. So Jesus told them this parable so that his followers would know how to think about the times in which they live and they would know what to do. What should we do when it looks like the kingdom is about to appear? The answer is we should pragmatuomai. This is a little Greek word that I want to teach you. And, and if you catch the meaning of the words, it could change everything. You see, God wants to raise your vision. He wants to lift your expectations. He wants to change your mindset. He wants to lead you into achieving better results. What are we supposed to do in this season? We are supposed to pragmatuomai. Now, I'm going to teach you this word, and it's not as daunting as it looks. It's really quite easy. The first part of the word is the word pragma, from which we get our English word pragmatic. So you can say that with me, pragma, pragma. All right, the second part of the word is to. And the third part of the word is oh my. All right, let's put it together. Say it with me, pragma to oh my. If you're reading the NIV translation this morning, that word pragmatuomai is translated in verse 13 as put this money to work. Some other translations say trade with this or invest with this. If you're reading the King James this morning, it is translated occupy. Occupy until I come. You know, occupy is kind of an unfortunate translation, really, because the word occupy can mean merely to just take up space. You know, that's all people. Some do, all some people do is they just take up space. And some of us take up a little more space every year. No wonder we need a bigger sanctuary. <laughs> uh, occupy can mean just to keep busy. And some people are good at keeping busy without ever accomplishing anything. But, but this word, pragmatuomai, is a banking term. It means to trade. It means to invest with positive results. Pragmatuomai means bear fruit. Pragmatuomai means 
produce. It means succeed, thrive, prosper, flourish, enlarge, increase, multiply, grow. The king literally says, here is a deposit. Now go make profits with it. Go succeed with it. As we think about these times, what is the outlook Jesus wants us to have? What should be our game plan? What should be our expectations? What should we do? We should pragmatuomai. We should make profits for our king. Parables are vehicles that Jesus used to communicate spiritual truths, to reveal spiritual truths. Jesus said, I speak to you in parables because to you... It is given to know the mysteries, the secrets of the kingdom. And as I look at the parables of the minas, I find some vital information for making profits in these times. And I want to share them with you today. Some vital information for making profits in these times. First of all, I see some inside scoop on our king. Some inside scoop on our king. Here is the scoop. Our king is worthy. In this parable, Jesus refers to actual historic events that happened around the time of his birth. Just before Jesus was born, Caesar bestowed upon Herod the Great the title King of Palestine. When Herod the Great died, his son Archelaus was left in charge of Judea. Archelaus traveled to Rome to receive his commission from Caesar, and while he was there, he asked for the title of king, just as Caesar had given his father. But the Jews sent a delegation to Rome behind Archelaus to complain because he was a brutal dictator. During one Passover, he massacred 3,000 Jews in the temple, and he canceled the Passover celebration. So Caesar granted Archelaus authority over Judea, but he was denied the title of king, and a few years later, he was stripped of his power altogether. But unlike Archelaus, our king, Jesus, has been found worthy in heaven of his title. He's worthy because he is of noble birth. He is the seed of Abraham. He is the son of David. He is the son of God. He's worthy because his authority has been derived from God above. He's worthy because he is a good king, a faithful leader. He is a good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep. One of the most striking things to me in this parable is how the third servant completely missed the character of the king. He considered the king fearsome, harsh, hard. He considered the king to be unfair. But the funny thing is the king was exactly opposite of what that servant supposed. Some inside scoop about our king. Our king is worthy. And another thing I find, our king is a giver. Our king is a giver. The third servant said to the king, you take without giving. But actually, the king had given them everything they needed before he left. You see, our king is a giver. He is the giver of life to everything that lives and moves and has its being. He is the giver of the light of human consciousness and conscience. He, he freely bestows every good blessing on earth enjoyed by men. He gives people a family. He gives them a place to call home. He gives daily bread. Psalm says he opens his hand and he satisfies the desire of every living thing. You know, this giving nature of our king is something that distinguishes him from every other god worshipped on earth. Only our king is a giver. was in Indonesia a little over a week ago, and uh, although Indonesia is the most populous Muslim nation, I spent a couple days on the island of Bali, and Bali is overwhelmingly Hindu. In fact, they call Bali the island of the gods. And everywhere we went in Bali, there were these little cardboard trays, like, you know, the kind that you get french fries in for takeout. Little cardboard trays everywhere on the ground, in front of every shop, in front of every home, uh, on every street corner, everywhere you looked, little cardboard trays with 
flower petals and pieces of fruit and spices and other little things in them. They were offerings to the gods. The Balinese people make offerings five times a day, every day, in order to appease the gods so that the gods won't make them sick or curse their finances or cause some catastrophe to come on their family or on their business. In fact, our missionary to Bali, Don Butera, told me that the Balinese never ever go away on vacation because they fear what might happen should someone miss making an offering on their behalf five times a day. How sad. You see, no other god is a giver like our king. Shiva and the Hindu gods are not givers. Buddha is not a giver. Allah of Islam is not a giver. Ancestral spirits are, are not givers. If the gods give anything at all, they give it begrudgingly. They have to be cajoled. They're capricious. They're cruel. They toy with people. They have to be appeased and persuaded not to harm their own devotees. Who would worship such a God when we have a king who gives so freely. And you know, our king not only gives blessings to meet our physical needs, but our king gave himself to meet our dire spiritual needs. You see, our king doesn't merely sit on his throne in heaven far away and dispense goodies to us. But when we were in trouble, when we were in grave danger, when we were in dire need of rescue, when we were unable to help ourselves, our king came running to us himself. Jesus emptied himself of his heavenly glory. He took on a human nature and a human body. He became a servant. He gave his life on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. He rose again from the grave, defeating death and hell and disarming demons. What other Savior, called by any other name, has ever done what Jesus has done? Not only does he give us his blessings, but he gave his own life and he gives us eternal life. What other savior could be called Emmanuel, God with us? No wonder God has given him a name that is above every name. No wonder one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that our king, Jesus, is Lord. Our king is worthy. Our king is a giver. And another thing I find, our king is a rewarder. The third servant said to the king, you take what others have worked for. Actually, nothing could be further from the truth. When the king returned, not, not only did he allow his faithful servants to keep what they had earned, but he heaped more on top of it. The servant whose mina had earned ten more was given ten cities to rule. The servants who, whose mina had uh, earned five more, he gave five cities to rule. When the king took away the one mina from the unfaithful servant, we find that the first servant was still holding the ten that he earned, and the king added one more to it. The king didn't take away what anyone had earned. The king added added to it because that's the kind of rewarder our king is. He is a rewarder of faithfulness. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He is a rewarder of those who give hilariously. Jesus said, give and it shall be given back to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. God will cause men to pour into your lap. Some vital truths for profitability in our times. First of all, some scoop, inside scoop about our king. Second, some inside scoop about our times. Some inside scoop about our times. Here's the scoop. Our king is physically absent, but his authority remains present. Jesus is telling us that the king was physically here. God became flesh. God put on the body of a man and he came to earth. The king was physically here, but now for a little while he's gone. He's ascended to heaven where he's at the right hand of God making intercession for us. But he's coming back again. 
And while he's gone, this is still his dominion. He is still the boss. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. His orders still stand. We are still under his command and in his care. We are still his agents. Some more scoop about our times. While our king is absent, he has made ample provision for his work to carry on. The king calls his servants together and he gives them a deposit and he says, Pragmatuomai, occupy until I come. Look after my affairs until I come. Carry on my work until I come. Multiply, grow until I come. That's the time in which we live. Right now, Jesus is physically absent from the earth, but his work is still going on through you and me, his servants. And his word to us is, occupy until I come. Preach the gospel until I come. Heal the hurting until I come. Bind up the broken until I come. Deliver the captives until I come. Shine as lights in the world until I come. Impact your culture until I come. Make disciples until I come. Baptize new believers until I come. Impart the gift of the Holy Spirit until I come. Equip the saints to perpetuate the work of the ministry until I come. Build my church until I come. Some inside scoop on our times. The third thing I find, there are some who refuse to accept our king. There were some who said, we don't want this man, we don't want this Jesus to be our king. Don't be distracted by them. Don't be dismayed. Don't be disheartened. Don't be derailed. You see, their descent doesn't diminish his authority. Their descent doesn't diminish our call to pragmatuomai. It doesn't devalue the deposit that we've received from the king. It doesn't cancel his commission. In Jesus' parable, the dissenters did not stop the king's servants from being fruitful and profiting, and it won't stop us either. When the king returns, there will be justice. In the meantime, it's just us. In the times in which we live, there are inequalities that go unresolved. There are injustices that go unpunished. Can I tell you that in the day in which we live, from the west coast of Africa all the way across Africa, the Middle East, across Asia, all the way to Southeast Asia, from one end to the other of what they call the 1040 window, there are believers giving their life for Christ every day. When the king comes, there will be justice, but right now it is just us. But let's not get distracted by the dissenters. Jesus told another parable about a wheat field with some weeds in it. The servants were all bothered and distracted. They were obsessing over the weeds. They said, let's go pull out those weeds. And the wise owner said, no, no, just leave the weeds be. Let's just concentrate on the maturity of the wheat. Beloved, listen, rather than fretting over how bad the dissenters are, let us look through eyes of faith. Let us see the field as God sees it and see the opportunities God has put in front of us and get to work. Let's pragmatuomai. Some inside scoop on our times. It's hard to predict when our king will return, but he will return. In the parable, Jesus says the king went to a far country. Travel being what it was in those days, that meant it was hard to predict when he would come back. See, Jesus was just 17 miles away from Jerusalem and Jericho. It, it was easy to calculate how long it would take him to get to Jerusalem. But a trip to Rome, that was another story altogether. A trip to Rome involved caravans. Uh, a trip to Rome involved sailing ships on uncertain seas. It involved flights on jet blue. You might be left sitting on the tarmac for days, locked in a plane, unable to get out. Jesus is telling us that there is no telling when he will return, but he will return. You know, the first time he came, he came as God's suffering servant. The first time he came as the Lamb of God who gave his life 
for the sins of the world. But this time when he comes, he will come as the roaring lion of Judah. This time he'll come in a full manifestation of his royal power and glory. Every eye will behold him and all the nations of the earth will mourn because of him. This time he'll come on a white horse with the angelic armies of heaven with a sword in his mouth wearing a robe dipped in blood with a name written on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords and with his reward in his hand. So if the king is coming back soon, let him not find us slacking off. Let him not find us coasting. Let him not find us dilly-dallying, losing ground, distracted by everything else in the world. If he really is coming back soon, let him find us engaged in pragmatuomai. Let him find us bearing fruit. Let him find us producing. Let him find us succeeding and prospering and growing. Let him find us packing out this house, not just four times every weekend, but how about six, seven, eight, nine, ten times? Let him find us building phase two. Let him come next weekend when we're breaking ground. Let him come when we're excavating this fall. Let him come when we're pouring cement this winter. Let him come when we're flying steel girders next spring. Let him come on dedication day when we're cutting the ribbon. And we'll say to him, welcome back, King Jesus. Look, your mina, it has earned ten more. Let him reply to us, well done, good and faithful servants. Some vital truths for profitability in our times. Some inside scoop on our king. Some inside scoop on our times. And finally, some inside scoop on ourselves. Worship team, come rescue me. Some inside scoop on ourselves. Here's the scoop. First of all, we have been given a living deposit. I hate to break it to you, but... Every profit that you've made for the sake of Christ isn't really the product of your ability. Rather, it is the product of the king's powerful deposit. You really can't take credit for it. It wasn't you. It's what the king deposited in you. Paul said we are confident ministers in Christ. Not that we are competent ourselves but rather our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. He has hidden his treasure in our earthen vessels. What treasure have we received from our king? One thing we've received is a deposit of faith. Faith is a God-given ability to trust God to do great things. Faith means that I am bullish about my future prospects. Faith means that I trust in God's character and God's promises. Faith means that I believe that God is able and shall do exceedingly abundantly above what I could ask or even imagine in my wildest dreams. What treasure have we received from our king? We've received a deposit of his grace. Do you know that grace is God's supernatural power operating inside of me? Grace strengthens my thinking processes. Grace stabilizes my emotions. Grace stabilizes my will. It solidifies my will. I'll tell you what, we're praying for you, the staff. Every Tuesday morning, we, we start our week by spending a couple hours in prayer for you. And here's what we're praying for right now. We're praying that in our church family, there would be no mental or emotional instability whatsoever. That you would be clear-minded. That you would be strong and sound and steady-minded. That there would be no mental incapacity. That there would be no mental or emotional disability that would hold you back. Let me tell you something. People out there are wacky and they're getting wackier. But in here, we're healthy and we're getting healthier by the grace of God inside of us. I want to tell you, Bipolar disorder, it shall not be in this family. Anxiety, it shall not be. Depression, it shall not be. Paranoia, it shall not be in this family. I will not permit it. 
I will not tolerate it. I will not allow it. God's grace is strength inside of us. The Holy Spirit administers to us the shalom of Jesus, the wholeness of Jesus' own personhood is distributed to us by the Holy Spirit. Grace makes you strong. You're going to be strong-minded. You're going to be strong in your emotions, and you're going to be, uh, it's going to be easy for you to make good and right decisions and to stick with them because God's grace is strengthening you. Grace is supernatural abilities dispensed to you by the Holy Spirit, gifts of the Holy Spirit that help you think like God and speak like God and act like God. Grace means God's favor is on you. Listen to me. The favor that was on Joseph in Egypt is on you. The favor that was on Daniel in Babylon is on you. The favor that was on Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. The favor that was on Esther in the king's court is on you. You know what it says about Esther? It says when they looked at her, do you know why she was more beautiful than everyone else? It says in Hebrew when they looked at her, they saw grace on her. It was the grace, the favor of God that made her stand out. The, the favor of God that was on Mordecai the favor of God that was on Nehemiah, the favor of God that was on Ezra, the favor of God is on you, the favor of God is on your resume, the favor of God is on your proposal the favor of God is on your bid the favor of God is on your buying and on your selling you shall be blessed in the city, you shall take it, receive it, you shall be blessed in the field you shall be blessed in your business I tell you, God's going to help you with your buying and selling He's going to help you buy low. He's going to help you sell high for a very good price. What have we received? What treasure have we received from our king? We've received a deposit of his spirit inside of us who guides us, who gives us wisdom, who gives us supernatural creativity. I speak over you entrepreneurship in Jesus' name. The Holy Spirit strengthens and guards us. When the servants report back to the king, we discover that the power for pragmatuomai was not on their efforts, but the power for pragmatuomai was in the king's deposit. Lord, your mina has earned ten more. Your mina has earned five more. The first servant realized a 1,000% return. The second servant realized a 500% return. The only servant who had no return was the one who did not nothing with the king's deposit. Some inside scoop on ourselves. We've been given a deposit, and second, we've been given a divine commission. We've been given a divine commission. Listen, here's the tweetable line of the weekend for you. His commission is his permission. His commission is his permission to succeed. His commission is his permission to be fruitful. His commission is his permission to overcome every obstacle. Listen, I want to tell you, wake up. I want to tell you something about pragmatuomai, and I want you to catch it, receive it in your spirit. Listen to me. Pragmatuomai is at the same time both a command and a blessing. Pragmatuomai is an order to be fruitful, and at the same time, it is a blessing that enables us to be fruitful. It's just like God's blessing on Adam and Eve. God ordered them, go forth and be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and then God blessed them to get the job done. And they've done pretty well. 6,000 years later, 6.5 billion people on planet earth, and they're still going forth. It's like God's command on Joshua. God said to Joshua, be bold, be very courageous. Have I not commanded you? In other words, Joshua, if I told you to do it, will I not also supply you with everything you need to get through it? And John Jesus describes it this way. You didn't pick me, but I picked you and I ordained you to bear fruit and more fruit and much fruit and fruit that remains. Beloved, listen to me. May God give you grace. His call on your life is a call to succeed and not to fail. It's a call to abundance and not to mediocrity.
It's interesting that the only one who didn't succeed is the one who did nothing. That's the only way you can fail in Christ, is to do absolutely nothing. Jesus said, may God give you vision to see that this is harvest time. And if you will only thrust in your sickle, I promise you, you will draw your hand back full of reward for eternal life. Some inside scoop about ourselves. We've been given a deposit. We've been given a commission. And finally, this. Our success rests on our faith. Our success rests on our faith. Hebrews says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. He who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Paul said, since through God's mercy we have received this ministry, we don't lose heart. It is written, I believed, and therefore I have spoken. Paul says, with that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. I'm going to give you three keys for success in Christ, and then we're done. We're going to share communion, and we're going to go on with our weekend. But let me give you these three things real quick. Three keys for success in Christ. First of all, we get what we expect. We get what we expect. The first and the second servants expected to make money and they made money. They expected to be rewarded by the king, and they were handsomely rewarded by the king. The third servant expected to fail, so he failed. He expected to be treated harshly, so he received harshness. He expected to lose what little bit he had, and so he lost it. Somebody take a word from the Lord today. In this journey, I can tell you exactly what you're going to get. You're going to get whatever it is you expect from God. If you expect to grow, you'll grow. If you expect to prosper, you'll prosper. If you expect to succeed, you will succeed. If you expect to barely hold on, you'll barely hold on. If you expect to fail, you will fail. May God raise the level of your expectations. May God give you a holy expectation inside your heart. May God give you a holy expectation for your marriage. May God give you a holy expectation for your children and for your grandchildren. May God give you a holy expectation for your business. May he give you a holy expectation for your ministry. I tell you what I expect. I expect to start phase two next Sunday morning when we put a shovel in the ground. I expect to excavate in October. I expect to pour concrete. I expect to keep building that building till it's done. And when it's finished, I expect to reap more harvest in this place than we could have ever possibly imagined or dreamed. Three keys for success in Christ. We, ex we get what we expect. Secondly, we get what we confess. We get what we confess. The king said to the servant, I will judge you by your own words. You said I was unfair. You said I was a taker. You said I was harsh. So I will judge you by your own words. Beloved, listen to me. The power of life and death is in your tongue. With the heart, we believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. And with our mouth, we confess Jesus is Lord and so are saved. The power of life and death is in your tongue. What do you confess about our King? I confess that our King is worthy. I confess that our King is a giver. Every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, from the Lord of glory. I confess that our King is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. He is not a man that He should lie, nor the Son of Man that He should change His mind. If He calls it blessed, then it must be blessed. I declare our King is faithful. I declare our King is merciful. I declare our King is a compassionate high priest. I declare that our King opens doors that no man can shut. 
Three keys to success in Christ. We get what we expect. We get what we confess. And finally this. We get what we invest. Everybody look at me and we're done. Take your napkin. Where's your napkin? Find your napkin. You, you all wondered why I gave you a napkin on the way in, right? You thought I was going to serve you hors d'oeuvres. You thought that. You thought butlers were coming and passing out trays of hors d'oeuvres. I saw some people uh, wiping their, their head with their napkin. That's okay if you, if you did that. It'll still work that way. Everybody look at me. God, give you grace. May the Lord give you grace to receive this word. The third servant was controlled by a spirit of fear. He said to the king, I was afraid. So he took the king's deposit and he wrapped it in a napkin and he buried it in the ground. Do you know there's only one other place in the Gospel of Luke, in fact, in the entire New Testament, where that word napkin appears. Luke uses that same word to describe the death cloth that was over the face of Jesus in the tomb. Because he was controlled by a spirit of fear, the third servant took the king's deposit and he took the king's commission and he wrapped it up in a death cloth and he buried it in the ground and it produced absolutely nothing. Beloved, listen to me and may God give you grace. Don't let that be your story. Don't let that be our story. Harvest time story. God has graciously and generously given good deposits to us. He's given deposits of faith and deposits of grace and deposits of His Spirit. He's deposited ministry gifts. He's deposited the gift of prophecy. He's deposited teaching gifts in you. He's deposited the gifts of works, uh, of miracles, uh, gifts of healing, word of wisdom, word of knowledge. And the King has graciously given us a commission. There are calls to ministry that, that have yet to be fulfilled. It's okay. You're on your way. You're on your your journey. Some of you are here for a little while. You're not going to stay too long. We don't want you to go, but God has ministry. He has more ministry for you than you're doing right now. Don't let it be our story. Don't let us take the deposit. Don't let us take the commission that the King has given us and out of a spirit of fear, wrap it in a death cloth and bury it. Instead, let us take His commission. Let us take His deposit. And let us put it to work. Pragmatuomai. Let's invest the king's gifts and the king's call. And let's be fruitful. Let's prosper. Let's grow. Let's thrive. Let's succeed. Let's occupy until he comes. Stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big praise.